Um, ladies and gentlemen, please give a very, very warm hand to the founder of the Next Web, co-founder, I should say, Boris Feldhuis von Santa. Thank you. You're welcome. So a warm hand sounds very different from what I expected. I thought a warm welcome, a warm hand sounds like you're going to give me a massage, um, which I need because uh, it's a stressful, uh, thank you, it's a stressful uh, week for us because we're hosting uh, the next web conference tomorrow and the day after, and we expect uh, 20,000 visitors, so it's kind of a big production, but it's great to be here because it means that nobody can ask me questions about the conference and I can just hang out with you. Uh, Oscar, I, I've known Oscar for many years, and he told me to take a gold shower in the morning, but I do it for a different reason, um, because he has great reasons to do it, and I do it for those reasons as well. But I also take the gold shower to remind me of something that helps me the rest of the day. And what, I, what it reminds me of is that I'm not here just to have fun, that being an entrepreneur is a painful experience that you have to take tough decisions all day, and it's just a lot of hard work. And that doesn't mean I'm not an optimist. I love my work. I enjoy everything about it. But it just helps to think about your work and, you know, if, if you're making the decision because it's the easy thing to do, or are you making a decision to please someone else? And this cold, awful shower in the morning, and you feel so vulnerable and you're still chilly from waking up and then you take the cold shower and it's like the worst thing in the world, especially the first week. But it reminds you like, all right, I got to, you know, when I get through this, I can go to the office and look somebody in the straight in their eyes and make a decision that they'll hate because I know it's the, the right thing to do. So although I love being an entrepreneur and I hope you're all enjoying being an entrepreneur, I think that's a great start of the day. So uh, you said something about the beer bottles at the office. Uh, actually, a lot of those bottles were champagne bottles. And that's uh, sort of uh, one of our mottos is uh, fake it till you make it. Um, and at one point, Patrick, the, the other founder of the Next Web, uh, he had a friend and he wanted to import champagne from Brazil or something. So not really champagne because you can't call it champagne, but it was something similar, the same procedure. And uh, Patrick was very optimistic and he said, we're going to borrow him uh, 3,000 euros and uh, he's going to build a business. It's going to be great. And of course, after a year, the guy came back to Patrick and he said, okay, the whole business failed. Uh, I don't have money to pay you back, but I still have a container filled with uh, champagne. <laughs> so do you mind if I pay you in champagne? And this was like the worst time in our company. Like we were just broke. We didn't have money for food, but we had three fridges filled with champagne. So often it would happen that we would just eat a sandwich with champagne. That's just uh, like a, a bare sandwich. But the funny thing is that people would come over and they would see all these empty beer bottles and they would tell each other like, well, business for Boris and Patrick has got to be amazing because there are <laughs> empty champagne bottles everywhere. They have a party every day. They, they're celebrating their success every day. And of course, reality is uh, different. It's a struggle uh, every day. And I read a book recently uh, about Google, which I really enjoyed. Um, and I enjoyed it so much is because there's one part in the book where the founders uh, talk about like the risks they took. And when you hear about Google, it seems like it was just two guys in a garage or a dorm room in this uh, case who came up with a brilliant uh, plan, wrote a business plan, started Google, and it was all you know, uh, champagne uh, from uh, that moment on. But of course, the real story is uh, a lot different. And uh, one of the founders explained that in the history, like the first 10 years of uh, Google, there were 15 moments where in the evening they didn't know if they would still, still have a company the next day. And they said, we, it's just like moments in the company where everything was unread and we didn't know if we would ever survive. And I think that's much more what entrepreneurial, yeah, entrepreneurship is about. Uh, I was at a conference uh, not too long ago and they asked me about uh, my biggest IT blunder. And I had to think about it for a minute and then I said, do you want to hear my IT blunder of the week, the month, the year, or what? Because you know my life is just going from blunder to blunder and, and fixing mistakes. And sometimes, sometimes I think that's my work. I go to the office, they tell me what the problems are and I try to fix them. That's sort of how you get to where you are. 
Now, in 1997, I started my first company, and it was a, a redirect service. So I, I bought domains in Tonga, surf to and travel to and listen to, and then put people would could uh, register one of these URLs and it would have like uh, listen to Bjork or travel to Malaysia and I would redirect those to their homepage and this was a concept I, I uh, built and um, I started giving away these addresses for free and after about a year I had given away a million of these addresses and um, each uh, visitor each address would get about four visitors a day so I had four million redirects a day, and we would display one of those big pop-up banners, which you can't do anymore, but at the time it was a good business. And we sold those ads. So one day, a company said, hey, how many ads can I, can I buy? And we said, well, four million a day. And they said, wow, how is that possible? And so we ex explained the concept a bit, and they said, well, can we buy your company? And then... That's always a great call to have, of course, when somebody says that. But it was also like the sixth call in six months. Um, and this was a time, a very hectic uh, time, when everybody was like companies were buying companies all over the place. But every conversation we had always took a lot of time. And when you're talking about selling your company, in the back of your mind, you're thinking about what car you're going to buy and what house and what clothes and, and whatever you're going to spend money on instead of your business. So it's very uh, distracting. It's a fun process, but it's very distracting. So my business partner, who, who answered the call, said to this company, I don't mind talking to you about selling the company, but we only want to talk on the weekends, and a maximum of two weekends, uh, because else, if, you know, if you don't think there's going to be a deal, we just want to work on the company. And then this company said, well, that's fine, we'll negotiate with you, but do you mind flying to uh, Monaco? Because that's where our shareholder is. So we're like, well, you know, <laughs> sure, yeah. So that was a weekend of uh, Monaco uh, for us. And so we negotiated. And the second weekend, I remember walking outside and calling my mother. And I told her, I just sold a company for 21 million guilders, which you don't remind, but uh, that's like, uh, like euros, but then 50% off. Um, and that was a great goal to make because I graduated art academy, which means that my parents thought they would just have to support me for the rest of my life. <laughs> so that was a great call to make. And I, was, I had one third of the shares, so I was a, a, a paper multimillionaire. Now, that's in 1999, and I got my shares at 19 euros and 80 cents. And then I think two months later, the shares doubled in value. So I had, in theory, 14 million uh, in paper value. And then they went down to 12 euros, and then up to 18, and then down to 8, I think, and up to 36. And so it just went like up and down all the time. So at one point, we decided, well, let's just ignore these stocks for a while, because this is just like a yo-yo effect. And uh, let's just focus on this internet thing, because it's going to be great. So it's all good. And there was one detail also that they also gave me 800,000 guilders in, not cash, but they just transferred money, the rest was in stock. And I spent all of it because I thought that was like, the, it's like getting a tip, right? So I thought my, my, my money is really in the stock and this is just money I can spend. So I bought a silver Jaguar and uh, I did a, made a down payment on my house and I had tailor-made suits. I even had tailor-made underwear. Seriously. Um, no more details about that. But anyway, uh, there's no reason why you would ever need tailor-made underwear. That's not even me. Um, and then in, at the end of 2001, uh, of course, you, you know what happened. It was the, the, the crisis. And my stock went all the way down to four euro cents. So it turned out that the paper money I had was really just paper and not worth anything. And the money that I thought was just for spending was really the only money I made. And that taught me a great lesson as well. Because then a few months later, I started another company. And that didn't really go well. But at one point, KPN wanted to buy it, or we were negotiating with them. And we were at a meeting, and um, uh, they made us an offer, and we rejected it. We said, oh, that's not really a serious offer, right? So if you want to make a serious offer, you invite us back, and now we're just going home. So we walked out the door, and then my business partner, we were in the car, and my business partner said, well, that was exciting. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, negotiating is fun. And then he said, what if they don't come back? And then I'm like, well, then we're going to be you know, going bankrupt in two months. 
and I'll probably go bankrupt myself in three months, and so that would suck. And he's like, yeah, yeah, well, let's hope they come back. <laughs> and, um, and then a week later, I was in my Silver Jaguar with my girlfriend, and she wasn't my girlfriend for that long yet. And at one point she said, so Boris, how are you doing really? And that's always a scary question, <laughs> because for an entrepreneur, you know, you fake it until you make it, and you're always positive, everything is always going great. But when somebody asks, how are you doing really? And you got to think about, you're like subtracting uh, all the money you own, and you're like, ooh, actually it's not going well. So I thought about it for a moment, and I, ex I told her like, well, you know, if KPN doesn't buy the company, we're going to go bankrupt, and I'm going to go bankrupt myself. And she said, what does that mean? I said, well, we got to sell the house, uh, I got to sell this car, um, I'm going to go bankrupt like personally, which means they'll open your mill for four years. And, uh, and so, but, uh, but you've got a job, so we'll just live over your money and then <laughs> live in an apartment in the north or something. Uh, um, and so she was quiet for a while. <laughs> and I remember where I was, it was like the longest minute in my life, of course. Uh, so we were driving in the car. And then after a minute she said, well, we'll be happy there either way, right? Uh, and that was a moment where I'm like, wow, this is like, I, I'm still staying with her, definitely, uh, because I got to live off her money as well. But, uh, <laughs> but now also because I thought this is a great match. Because, and I realized then that this is something that you need as an entrepreneur. And people often say, well, as an entrepreneur, you got to take risks, right? And it's all about taking risk. And that sounds great. Like, you're like, oh, I love taking risks. But taking risks, is not like uh, jumping out of an airplane with a parachute. It's, it's realizing that you might lose everything and being comfortable with that. So the Google founders were comfortable with that. They had 15 moments where they risked everything and they knew we might win or we might lose everything. And we're fine with that. And even today, our company, we take a lot of risks. Uh, we're opening, we, we uh, grew the conference uh, three times. So last time, last year we had 7,000 visitors. Now we have 20,000 visitors. Uh, that's all upfront uh, investment. So if a volcano uh, bursts in Iceland and all the flights are canceled, you know, I gotta live with my girlfriend again in a few months. That's the risk you take. And that's a very big, uh, uh, an underestimated part of doing uh, business, which I wanted to share with you today. So I have uh, one final uh, story, which is uh, maybe more optimistic for you. And it's uh, uh, about a company called Twitter Counter. And Twitter Counter is a, a statistics company for Twitter, and it now has its own CEO, and uh, it's a big team, and they're doing very well. But it used to be just a hobby project of mine. And this is, I think, a formula for how most companies are built. So what do you think, uh, as Oscar explained, uh, you wrote a business plan and you go to the bank, you don't get money, and uh, that's how a lot of people still think that you build a business. You come up with a great concept, and I still get emails of people who say, hey, I've got a great concept, do you want to buy it? And I'm like, no. Um, but in reality, it goes more like this. So I was at an event, and uh, this was uh, when Twitter had, I think, 300,000 users. Um, and somebody came up to me and he said, hey, great article on the next web this morning. And I said, oh, great, uh, do you subscribe to the email newsletter or do you have uh, the, the RSS feed or something? And he said, no, I follow you on Twitter. And this was a new thing for us. So I said to my partner, like, do, uh, do we post our stories to Twitter? And he goes, oh, yeah, it's automatically uh, just all the stories are posted to Twitter. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. And, and I said, do we know how many people follow us on, on Twitter? And then my partner said, no, no, I don't keep track of that. And so I, I, at this conference, I, I looked around, like, is there a service that tracks how many readers you have on Twitter? And of course, you can go to the website and check the number, but I wanted to see the statistics and growth. And it turned out that there wasn't such a service. So I was talking to the developer, the only developer in our company at the moment, uh, at that time, and I said, I think we could make a script and I go to the mobile side of, there was no API yet uh, for our Twitter. Go to the mobile version of Twitter and then we get the follower number and put it in the database and then we generate an image and then people can put an image on their homepage with a number and, you know, this works. I think we can build this. I, I think you could build it in a day. It's so simple. And he's like, yeah, maybe I could. And, and it sounds like fun. But uh, we don't have time for that. And the only thing I heard was, that sounds funny. 
because there's a quote by uh, Asimov, a uh, famous uh, writer and uh, scientist, and he said, the most important breakthroughs in science are never eureka, like I've got it, but hey, that's funny. And he said that because he had a research uh, institute, something like this, with like 50 scientists working around, and nobody ever put his hand in the air and said, Eureka, I found something. Uh, he said, that's not what happens. What, uh, what happens is that I'll see three people standing around laughing, and I'll walk over and I say, hey, what's going on? And then they say, well, we were trying to add this to this, and we expected this, but then this happened, and that's funny. And he said, those are the breakthroughs. So when my partner said, that's funny, I'm like, it's funny, that's, you know, we should, that's a good sign. But he refused, he didn't want to build it. And I got so frustrated, this was a Thursday, that I went home and I thought, all right, I'll take the most difficult part of building this thing, and that's generating the image. I have no idea how to, I understand PHP a little bit, but I don't get how you get from text to PHP like an image. So, but of course, I'm a bad developer, but a great Googler, so I Googled it, and within 30 minutes I had it working. I'm a copy-paste developer. So I had the image working, and then I built the spider re thing to get the, the thing and the, the number, and I combined it in an old text database, which is the worst thing you can do. And so I built the whole thing in a weekend. And, but I'm such a bad developer that I didn't build a front end. So I, I, it was just when you went to the site, you would see my statistics. And if you wanted to see your own statistics, you had, to, you had to change my name for your name on Twitter, and it would show your statistics, which is very weird for statistic service. You usually have like a screenshot of what statistics look like, and then you log in, and then you see your own statistics. That's just because I didn't know how to build that. So I worked on it from Thursday to Thursday, and then Thursday evening, my partner said, so what's your plan with this? hobby project that you're building. I said, well, I'll refine it for another three months, just as a side project, and then maybe we can launch it and see what happens. And then we had a bottle of champagne, and we said, oh, okay, fuck it, let's put it live. So exactly one week later, we put it live. And the, I didn't really design it either, so I just stole the CSS files from Twitter, I replaced Twitter with Twitter counter, and that was the site. So it looked just like Twitter. So we put it live, five, I got it, five minutes. Uh, so I put it live, and then the Twitter founders said, uh, saw this, and uh, they were just so small that the, the founder, uh, Biz and Jack, they emailed me and said, like, hey, your Twitter counter looks cool, but uh, you, know, you can't just rip off our design. I'm like, I know, I know, I'm just super busy, I didn't get around to changing it. And, <laughs> and he's like, well, can you please change it? And I'm like, oh, I'm so busy, I don't have time to change it. But uh, I said, well, you know what, I'll stay up the whole night to change it uh, if you blog about it and tweet about it. And they're like, yeah, sure, that's fine. So I tweeted, of course, I said, I need a new logo and a new design. And then a guy in the train sent me a logo five minutes later. This was the logo for five years. And somebody else said, well, if you just replace the blue for another color and change the font, it looks completely different. And I'm like, okay, cool. So 30 minutes later, we had a new design and it lasted for five years. So I emailed it back to Jack and, and Biz, and they wrote about it on, on blog.twitter and tweeted about it. And then everybody, of course, who was on Twitter, only 300,000 people saw it. And they went to the site and they started checking their uh, statistics, which no doubt crashed the server. But, but anyway, it, it was sort of an overnight small success. And two weeks later, somebody emailed me and they said, I see you're getting a lot of followers on Twitter because you're the featured user on Twitter counter. And I was on the front page, of course. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then they said, can you make me the featured user on Twitter counter? <coughs> now, I'm a business guy. So I said, well, sure, what are you offering? And then he said, $50 a week. So I said, yeah, you're now the featured user on, on Twitter counter. Send me the money. And I walked over to my partners and I said, I have great news. We're cash flow positive. <laughs> Because the hosting costs were $30 a month, and I had now made $50 in one week. So, so I tweeted this, like as a joke. And then four other people said, I'll take a week too. So I had to walk back to my partners, and one of them is the, like, he started economics. So I said, we're sold out, what do I do? And he said, double prices. Like, all right, that's a smart guy. <laughs> So I doubled prices, and then we sold it in another three weeks. And then I wrote to the developer, and I said, like, this is not scalable. And he said, all right, I'll change it in a pay-per-view thing. So people can pay $50, and they get a certain amount of views. And you know what? We'll show three t featured users at the same time, and then we'll just start, start cashing. So pretty, pretty soon, we were doing 100000 in revenue a month. And then the, the, the hilarious thing happened, because there were 
um, my developer, he said, like as a joke, he added one subscription, and it was not $50, and not $100, and $250, it was $25,000. Because he just thought, there's always one sucker who buys the most expensive thing, right? So we did, and we sold three. <laughs> the first month. And the thing was, there were East Coast rappers, and I wanted to have more followers than West Coast rappers, so it is, they were competing on Twitter followers. <laughs> Anyway, I'm out of time, so quickly the moral of the story. The moral of the story is, if I would have written a business plan for Twitter Counter, it would have never existed. Because I didn't know the business plan. I didn't have a plan, I just thought it was funny, it was a great hack project. So my message to you today is take that gold shower. Uh, being an entrepreneur is harder than you think, you gotta take tough decisions, but focus on what's funny and have a lot of fun. Enjoy your day, thank you.